Union Church, let's stand our feet together. We're so excited you're here with us today. If you're watching online, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to praise Jesus in this place. Let's lift him up. Come on.
for a quick second. Hey everybody and welcome to West Cobb Church. My name's Todd and I'm glad you're here. Hey, whether you're watching online or if you're live in person with us, text the word CONNECT to the number on your screen so you can get our digital worship guide and follow along this morning. If this is your first time joining us, you can click the button that says CONNECT. You can fill out as much or as little information that you feel comfortable with and someone will be in touch with you shortly. They'll get you information about West Cobb Church and help you with any other questions you may have. On your digital guide, you'll find another area where you can connect with others. You can find information on what's happening at the church, and there's a place where you can fill out a prayer request. You can even find any community outreach projects we may currently have going on. Hey, and parents, grandparents, don't forget, we've got our services for kids, preschool and elementary, all online right now. You can find it under the family section. They're tons of fun, and they're going to learn something, so you can throw that to them while you're watching the service, or you can watch it later this week as a family. So as some of you know, West Cobb Church has been partnering with Storehouse Ministries. Last week, we sent some grocery bags home. Hopefully you filled yours up. If you missed last week, there's still a chance we have some bags left. Grab one on your way out. But either way, we need those back next Sunday so that we can fulfill our obligation with Storehouse. Hey, great news if you have kids at your house. This year, we're throwing Easter Jam since we can't get together for an Easter egg hunt. It's a digital experience like you've never had for Easter, and we're sending it home just for you. There's going to be Easter eggs so we can find those, but more importantly, there's a family service that's big enough for everyone to join in. Tons of fun and the Easter story like you've never heard it. So be sure to sign up online. It's all free, all from the kids' ministry, just for your home. So now I've got some great news. This year, we actually get to celebrate Easter together. Can you believe it? This is gonna be so much fun and we're looking forward to it. We actually have two days worth of services planned, all to make sure that everybody in our community, including your family, have a chance to worship the reason that we gather as a church in the first place. I can't wait. But with that, we're also gonna need some volunteers in some critical places. The kids area, greeters, there's tons of places. There's always a place for you to serve. Hey, thanks again for joining us today and thanks for being a part of our church family. You're important to us. You're important to God. Hey, we're gonna continue our series called Encounters now, but first, we get a chance to worship. Come on. User error, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning, guys, come on, we're gonna worship this morning. Let's sing this out.
sing swing wide of the Lord with you guys today. Um, I just wanted to share a piece of my heart with y'all um, and an area that God has been molding me and shaping me. Uh, and it's, it's the area of surrender. And I've been asking God a lot. I'm like, God, what do I need to give up? What is, what is keeping me from being as close to you as I possibly can? And I'm gonna answer really honestly this morning. And it's the need to be liked, to be liked by people. That is something I struggle so much with. And at the end of the day, God has been revealing to me that I live for one person. I live for an audience of one. Can we give him praise? You live for one person and other people's opinions don't matter. And that is what God has been speaking over my life. And this morning, we're gonna sing a song called Still in Control. And I don't know what area of your life God would ask you to surrender, but I would encourage you to lean into this moment and ask him that question as we sing this song together today.
He's so worthy. Amazing time of worship. You guys can be seated. You guys doing good today? Lose an hour of sleep and you guys still look good. All right. Uh, We're excited for those that are tuning in online from Louisiana to Colorado and several other states. Man, it's been incredible to see how God is using our digital platform online where people, family can tune in and watch what God's doing here in the metro Atlanta of West Cobb Church. And so can we give it up for those that are tuning in online? Uh, It's even encouraging for those, us, that are out of town sometimes that we can still engage and not miss what what God's doing and through the series and all those things. And so, man, we're blessed to have that. We're blessed for the creative team, our worship team. Man, they just kill it every single week. Well, today we're continuing our series called Encounters. Now, if you were here last week, we kicked this series off. All throughout the Gospels, we see people encountering Jesus. And, uh, you know, we see that all the time throughout uh, even our days. Every single week, people encountering Jesus, meeting Jesus for the very first time, Jesus changing their life. And one thing we talked about is when you encounter certain people in your life, it marks you. And so I remember as a kid, you know, and, and maybe you realize that as a kid or now as a kid or, or currently where you're at, you, you have a friend that you're different because you encountered that friend. You know, hopefully it's your spouse. <laughs> you're different because of your spouse. Uh, maybe it's a mentor in your life. You know, growing up, I had guys that mentored me and took me um, to where I needed to go. And I still have that today, and so those mentors mark me. And so when you encounter Jesus, it marks you. He changes your life. He's the greatest person you can ever meet, and he's the greatest experience you can ever have. And so throughout this series that leads up to Easter, we're going through encounters. Last week, we talked about the encounter of the rich, young ruler. And so if you missed that, you weren't here, you weren't tuned on, I want to encourage you guys to go back and watch that encounter. But we learned this, it is, imp- it's, it is possible to encounter Jesus, ask the right question, and still leave empty. It is possible to encounter Jesus, ask the right question, and still leave empty. We know money and possessions wasn't the issue of the rich young ruler. It was sacrifice. It was like Taylor said, surrendering. Because, you know, we all have issues, we all have struggles, but it's the fact that we've got to learn that his way is greater than ours. And when we're not willing to give that up, when we're not willing to sacrifice it and surrender it, then we've never really encountered a true Jesus in our lives. And that was the issue with the rich young ruler. He wasn't willing to give what's in his heart to follow after Jesus. And today we're going to look at another encounter um, that I want to encourage you guys, if you have your Bibles, to go ahead and get them out, you version on your phones. We're going to have um, the verses and points that are going to be on this massive TV that I love so much. Um, But I want to encourage you to dive in, and when we see this encounter, I want to ask you a question. Where do you find yourself in this story? 
Where do you find yourself in this encounter? Whether you grew up in church your whole life or you're walking in here for the first time, tuning in online for the first time, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, where do you see yourself in this? John chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 2. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And so I want us to stop right there and visualize what's going on in just these first two verses. Jesus is heading to the temple, the church. And his goal is that he wants to teach people, very similar to maybe what's going on right now. Maybe it's a small group that you were in earlier. The whole goal is Jesus is teaching them, equipping them to, 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 to follow after God. And we see the religious men, the scribes and the Pharisees, drag a woman who we don't even know her name, very similar to the rich young ruler. Not sure if that's a coincidence with the counters or not. Some, some not but who was caught in adultery. Now, a couple of things we notice about this, where what I see, and, and hopefully maybe you point out in this, number one is, where is the man? Where's the man? He got caught in adultery as well, and he got to go scotch-free. Nowhere in the story do we see the man anywhere in this. It's just the woman. What, not sure what's going on there. Maybe he was a part of this. Maybe he wasn't. Number two, this woman was actually caught in the act. And so let's just be real and honest. Most likely, which means that she probably doesn't have much clothes on. If we're just being honest. And she gets thrown to the feet of Jesus. This is an encounter that's very different. Very humiliating. Very embarrassing. Imagine this woman who didn't, didn't have this on her agenda to encounter Jesus, didn't know this was going on, didn't know the next step, caught in adultery, thrown to the feet of Jesus, embarrassing and humiliating. The religious leaders didn't care about this woman. They were only using this woman as a tool to get to Jesus. Why? Why was that so important? And we see in this next passage, they, say, they said to him, teacher. Now, if you were here last week and you tuned in online last week, we, we see this very similar phrase when, when people encounter Jesus. Except last week, there was something before teacher. It was the word good. Now, this only happened if people realized that it was God, because only God is good, and no one encountered Jesus and said those things unless they knew it was God. And it's interesting that last week the rich young ruler classified him as good teacher, but the religious people did not. It's because they didn't believe who Jesus said he was. This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus. Jesus seems to be in a lose-lose situation here. According to the law of Moses, this woman is guilty. No questions asked. This woman is guilty and the penalty of this in the law says for this woman to be stoned. But Jesus finds himself in a dilemma. If Jesus said yes to this woman being stoned, then what would happen to his reputation as the friend of sinners? Most likely, the common person would abandon Jesus' teaching and never accept the message of grace in the gospel. The other side of this, if Jesus said, no, this woman doesn't need to be stoned or doesn't deserve to be stoned, then he was openly breaking the law that should subject him to be arrested. He's in a dilemma. 
What in the world is he going to do? And the scribes and Pharisees, these, these religious people, feel like they have finally got Jesus exactly where they want him. And Jesus responds with this. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Some translations say in the sand. And so Jesus is completely, what it seems like to me, he's completely ignoring the religious leaders in the question that they asked. Jesus, maybe you didn't hear us. You know, maybe, I don't know, you don't know the situation. But let me, let me ask you this again. And we get to the point in this passage of Scripture where we see this. Now, maybe you've read this passage of Scripture before. Maybe you've heard a message over this passage of Scripture before. But one of the the biggest questions in Christianity and in the Bible is actually over this passage of Scripture. What in the world did Jesus write down on the ground? What in the world did he write in the sand? And the answer is... We don't 100% know. We don't 100% know. There's nowhere in scripture that, that says this. There's theologians and scholars that differ. There's manuscripts that kind of point to an idea. And, and I tend to agree that what Jesus was writing down, this is just David's per, um, you know, perception, is that he was writing down, when he bent down and wrote on the ground with sand or on the ground, he was writing down the men that was judging this woman and their sins. So the name of the person and the sins that was deep down in the heart that maybe the one beside them didn't know or someone didn't realize, but deep down secrets, the shame, the guilt, the current situations that these guys were in. And so they ask him again. And they continue to ask him, maybe you didn't hear us. He stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. (laughs) And so we see here, instead of passing judgment on this woman, he passes judgment on the judges. Very interesting. He says, but you, you go ahead, Jesus is saying, go ahead and throw a stone. But as you do that, be very aware that I'm going to write down your name and your sin while you're doing this. Very interesting. But you go ahead and do it. You do whatever you feel right. And then we see, but when they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, and this is important, no one, Lord. That translation, that word Lord in in the gospels during encounters means that her eyes were open to who God and who Jesus actually was. Her life was transformed, it was changed, her eyes were open to something greater than who she was. And that's important. Everyone leaves, and Jesus is alone with this woman. Jesus is the only one worthy. If anyone were to throw a stone at Jesus based off of what Jesus just declared without sin, Jesus is the only one that should have the opportunity to do that. Everyone left, and Jesus is one-on-one with this girl. And instead of condemning her, he's one-on-one and tends to start a conversation. Ask a question. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Divine encounters often start with simple questions. As we're talking about encounters, as we lead up to Easter and praying for many people to experience and encounter Jesus, divine encounters often starts with simple questions, and Jesus does that thing. We see this over and over again. We see this with the woman from Samaria. We see this with the rich young ruler. Jesus asking questions. Now, that's interesting to me because um, I looked this up. Jesus asked 307 questions in the Gospels. 
That's interesting because why would Jesus be the one asking questions? Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus is all-powerful. Jesus is all-sovereign. Shouldn't people be asking Jesus the questions? And Jesus finds himself asking questions to people, especially encounters. And I think the reason of that is because Jesus wanted to listen and hear the heart of people. He wanted to hear their story. He cared for them, and he pursued after them, and he loved them. And in this encounter, Jesus was heading to the temple to be a part of a small group, to be a part of a worship service, and did anyone realize outside, outside of Jesus that a divine encounter was about to take place? Not even this woman knew what was about to take place. And Jesus has this conversation and asks this woman this question. Has anyone condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. Jesus says to go, to run with urgency. You are forgiven. You are free of your past. You're free of your shame. You're free of your guilt. God doesn't shame you for your past, but he fights for your future. And for some of us, we really need to hear that today. God doesn't shame you of your past. He doesn't ridicule you from, from what you've done or what you're currently involved in. And sometimes we see that from God. We see that, that he looks at us with that, with disappointment, with just um, disbelief and just saddens us. But he doesn't shame you for your past. He's fighting for your future. With Jesus, things change. Because of Jesus, there's grace, there's forgiveness. You are free from your shame, you're free from your past, you're free from your addictions. We see grace in this passage. But as we see grace in this passage, it's very important for you to realize this. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Grace is free. Forgiveness is free. But it's not cheap. And sometimes, including myself, we cheapen grace. We cheapen grace. And, but in reality, it costed Jesus everything of who he was. He pursued after you. He died for you. He came for you. He had compassion for you. He loved you enough to die for you. And we see in this passage, in this encounter, and from now on, sin no more, Jesus says. You're free. You're forgiven. There's grace. But sin no more. In John 8, we see that grace and truth come from Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. And you can't have one without the other. It's impossible to have one without the other. Don't confuse forgiveness with permission. Don't confuse forgiveness with permission. Just because you have been forgiven doesn't mean you have a license to go do what you want to do. But so many times we have this mentality, including myself, it's just one time. Jesus is going to forgive me. He's already forgiven me. There's grace for those situations. So I'm going to do what I want to do now, and I'm going to live for Jesus later. And just because I have grace, I can say what I want to say. Don't confuse forgiveness with permission because, listen, there is also holiness. There is also holiness, and when you encounter Jesus, he changes your life. You are called to be different, and you are called to be set apart. And you actually, as a believer, tuning in online or in person, if you call yourself a believer, changed by the gospel, you actually have victory over sin. Not because of who you are but because of who Jesus is, and Jesus has already conquered death, he already has victory, and because Jesus lives inside of you, you can now be free from sin. You can have victory, you can have power over it. Paul says this in Romans 6, verse 15. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, changed us, freed us 
made me new, does that mean we could go on sinning? Of course not. Of course not. You're free from that. God has called you to be holy. And so as we look at this encounter, as we look at this story, there's three things that we can learn about Jesus through this encounter. And I really want you to to write these down and lean into this as we just have a couple more minutes and we're going to respond. Number one, one thing we can learn from this encounter, Jesus isn't condemning. He isn't condemning. He isn't a condemning God. He isn't shocked by your past. He isn't shocked or surprised about your sin. He isn't caught off guard. He knows that you've made mistakes. He knows that you have shame. He knows that you have guilt. He knows the sins that are entangling your life right now. He's not a condemning God. Sinners are going to sin. You came into this world with a desire to live for your flesh and not by your spirit. Our third kid, third child, boy, uh, Owen, is two today. I don't have to teach Owen how to sin. He just does it. He's very good at it. We are born into this world with a desire to live for our flesh. No matter what promise, covenant, prayer that you wanted to do, it's just in your DNA and God doesn't condemn you. The, the, the most famous pastor, uh, passage in scripture in, in verse is John 3.16. But after John 3.16, it says this in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He doesn't condemn you. He sees you exactly where you're at, your current journey, your current situation, but he wants to take you to what he has for you. He isn't a condemning God. But number two, Jesus isn't compromising either. Jesus isn't compromising. Right after he says he doesn't condemn her, he says, go and sin no more. We have a tendency to fall in one or the other. I'm not a condemning person, but I'm also not a compromising person. And what happens is, if we're the condemning person, we don't want to condemn, so we compromise and we say this, I'm just trying to be relevant. David, you don't understand the times that we're in right now. You don't understand people, it's a different age, it's a new generation, Uh, you know, we just, we have got to fall where our society and culture is. It's just a different time. And we like to throw the relevant card. Right now, our society and culture says there is not absolute truth. Has anybody heard this? Social media, maybe you've experienced it, maybe you're, you're living in it currently, whatever you do. Society and culture says there's no absolute truth. And you've got to be relevant to where we are as a society and culture in our times. And I want you to see this and I want you to write this down. Without a belief in absolute truth, truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. Without a belief in absolute truth, Truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. And I'm going to be honest with you, that changes. Does it not? I could be happy one day and the next day I could go to something completely different. That all depends on my circumstance. That all depends on my situation. That, that um, de- de- determines who's kind of around me at the time. It depends on the time and the date. And all of those things. And the important thing to understand is Jesus was the most relevant person in the world. He was a friend of sinners. And more importantly, sinners wanted to be around Jesus. Jesus didn't condemn them. But he also didn't compromise. He didn't condemn them, but he doesn't compromise. And it says this in Hebrews 7, verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us. Who? For you and for me, who is holy. 
harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Jesus is not a condemning God. Jesus doesn't condemn you where you're at. He actually does the opposite. He pursues you right where you're at, but at the same time, he doesn't compromise because he wants to take where you're at and he wants to take you places that you've never been before. With Jesus, the next is always greater than the now. That's why we started this campaign called Next. Because we believe that. We believe with Jesus, wherever you're at, it is possible to go further, to go farther. And that's what Jesus is saying with this. The problem with so many is that we think happiness and holiness are at odds with each other. The number one reason why people don't say yes to Jesus because they encounter him, just like last week. The number one reason is because they're not willing to give up, sacrifice, surrender what they're currently in. It's the division and it's the dilemma of holiness and happiness. If I follow Jesus, I can't be happy. But it's the complete opposite. What Jesus is saying here, holiness is the pathway to true happiness and joy. To truly be happy means that you're truly being holy. To, to have the right joy, you're, you're, you're being sanctified through Christ. Jesus doesn't compromise in this issue. He wants you to go and be different, to be set apart. He's not a condemning God. He's not a compromising God. But number three, we see in this encounter, Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is compassionate. When this woman was brought to him in such a humiliating and embarrassing way, all Jesus could feel was compassion for her. It wasn't angry, but it was loving. He won her heart by being compassionate. This woman was caught in the act, not after, in the act. And the point of this encounter is not whether you get caught or not. It's whether you change your mind about what you're doing. It's about changing your mind, what you're doing, and how you're living. Jesus had compassion with this girl. And I believe even that this woman was in sin, caught in sin, encountered something radically different for the first time. I believe she was never the same. For the first time, she saw compassion, she saw love, she saw joy, and it moved her to the response of being different, of going and being a different, having different labels, being identified by something else. Because of this compassion, because Jesus didn't condemn her, but Jesus also didn't compromise who God was and what she was called to be. She left. And although there's very few things what we see from her after this, I believe she encountered something different that radically changed her life. You today and those watching online, where do you find yourself in this story? Maybe you're here today watching online and you've never had that encounter. You've never had an encounter where Jesus has changed your life. You might have been at church before, you might have said a prayer before, but Jesus has something so much more for you. And Jesus wants to radically change your life, recognizing that you are currently not where you need to be. But with Jesus, he can take you to places you've never been before. And maybe you're here today, you're watching online, and, and maybe you just need that part of the story to know that Jesus is not a condemning God. And so many times when you see Jesus looking at you, you see that you're not worthy. You see that you don't measure up. In reality, you don't. But through the eyes of Jesus, he loves you, he has compassion for you, and he pursues after your heart no matter where you are at today. 
but he also doesn't compromise. Don't confuse forgiveness with permission. If you are changed by Jesus Christ, when you walk outside these doors into a community that is looking for hope, they better see what Jesus, they better see Jesus in you. You don't have permission to say whatever you want to say. You can't use the grace card. It's grace and truth. And maybe today, Jesus needs to show on you compassion. Maybe you're in a tough season of life. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you do have sin that's entangling your life right now, and you can't seem to get out of it. I'm going to ask all of us to bow our heads and close our eyes, even those that are tuning in online. Divine encounters often start with simple questions. Just like Jesus asked this woman a question, I'm going to ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Right where you're at. Every head bowed, every eye closed, watched it online, wherever you're at. In your journey, who is Jesus? Is Jesus some person that you randomly go to, to go to church, or you randomly pray to, you get Jesus out of the box when you need him, or he's a vending machine God. When you have a prayer request, you put a quarter in and hope you get that in return. Or is Jesus someone that's radically changed your life? When you encounter someone that marks you, when you encounter someone that's authentic, real, created you with a purpose, he's called you to live and be different. And so maybe that's you today. Maybe God's knocking at the door of your heart and saying, I need to change your life. You need to follow me. And if that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want you to kind of slip up your hand so I can see it. Man, that's me. I need Jesus. Raise it real high. We have people, hands going up all over the room. Don't be embarrassed. Jesus is the greatest thing you can ever experience and the greatest person you can ever know. And if that's you, I want to encourage you. We're about to respond in a way. And and if you're raising your hand, even those tuning in online, there's a path that we want you to go on because we want to communicate what this looks like. And we want to come alongside of you and encourage you and help you. So I want to ask everyone to kind of kind of uh, look up at me, even those that are tuning in online, and this is what I want all of us to do. I want all of us to get our cell phone out, and you're saying, man, I did this last week. Fantastic. You can do it again this week. We're going to have a logo that's going to be on the screen, and if that's you, you're saying, man, I, I know I've, I have Jesus in my life. I know he's changed me. Not only have I encountered him, but I've walked away different. Then put your name in number one. We just want to encourage you. Nothing bad about being encouraged. But if that's you, for those that have raised your hand in this room and tuning in online and you're saying, I need and I have a desire to encounter something greater than myself. I need Jesus to change my life. Then we want you to put your name in number two because we want to come alongside of you and one of our pastors will reach out to you this coming week and we want to follow up with you. That's very important. And maybe you're at number three. You just need to take your next step. And maybe that's baptism. And we'd love for you to put your name in number three just so we know how to follow up with you and encourage you and lead you to the next step. The next is always greater than the now. And sometimes we get in this stage of being content. And Jesus is always wanting to move us forward, whatever that looks like. Maybe it's starting a small group. Maybe it's coming consistently to church. Maybe it's inviting a friend. Maybe it's diving into a Bible study plan. I don't know what that looks like. But Father, we love you. We're thankful for today. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to encounter you and live differently because you have conquered death. You have victory. You have authority. I love the Great Commission, but the Great Commission says before the Great Commission that that we can go because you've already gone. You have authority. And because you have authority means we can do what we get to do. And we're thankful for grace. We're thankful that you're not a condemning God. We're thankful that you don't see our shame, our past, our current situations. But God, convict us because you're also not a compromising God. Lead 
lead us to be holy. Let our community see something different about West Cobb Church because of the people that go to it, that are connected here. And God, we're thankful for your compassion. We're thankful that you pursue us right where we're at, but you want to lead us to something so much greater. And so as we respond, as we sing, I want to encourage you, even watching online, to allow God to speak into your heart. And more importantly, you respond with obedience to whatever that looks like as we sing. Father, we love you. We're thankful, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Creation knows the voice that's spoken to the boy the breath of bright the dust to lie and sing the stars to fall the darkness fears the voice that drove it back Church, let's stand and sing this together. Come on. My fight is not my own. It's in
serve an awesome God. And we're gonna continue in our worship right now together uh, as we move into our offering and our time of giving. And I wanted to encourage you guys with a scripture today out of Ephesians. It's chapter five, verses one through two. And it says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us when he laid his life down on that cross. And right now, as we continue to worship, we get to give back to him in a really small way. But we wanna thank you guys today uh, for your generosity and your joyful giving. You guys keep this place moving and moving toward the vision of building the kingdom of God. And uh, there's a couple ways you can give, they're on the screen. And we just wanna thank you guys so much. And uh, we also have a couple of announcements before you go today. Uh, the first thing is, in two weeks, we'll be doing communion together as a church on March 28th. So we're really excited for that as we head into Easter. Uh, as well as, do not forget to grab your storehouse bags on the way out. They're due next week. We love you guys so much, and we'll see you back here next Sunday.